so our next speaker is an exemplar, Dima Khalidi. I, I said this the other day, I've known her since she was born, and um, it's my real pleasure and honor to introduce her. She's the founder of an organization now rebranded as Palestine Legal, formerly known as Palestinian Solidarity Legal Support, which Dima said is kind of a mouthful. Um, so she will tell you what they do, and um, it's a, a small organization with three, currently three, extremely active lawyers who provide legal support in circumstances exactly similar to what Amani said. I, um, one of the things that their, another of their staff attorneys said is that the, fir the First Amendment has no Palestine exception. Bear that in mind. I mean, I've worked in the media in this country for 35 years, and I was subject, even at the Christian Science Monitor over the years, to exactly the same kind of double standard that Amani talked about at the Daily Targum. You know, if I took a trip, then who is funding the trip? It would all be extensively uh, interrogated, and I had to report it. People who were reporting stuff from Israel, nobody ever examined who was, who was paying for their trips. That stuff goes on in the media, in the national mainstream media, all the time, and the Christian Science Monitor was among the best of them. So anyway, I'm glad that you guys are here to take up the, uh, the struggle and take it to new levels. Dima Khalidi. Hello, it's so nice to be here uh, in such a full room. This is lovely. Um, I think it's crucially important that you hear about the, this issue about the way uh, that students on campuses are affected um, from students themselves or recent students themselves. Um, you know, it's, it's really, their experiences exemplify what uh, Palestine Solidarity Legal Support still PSLS, but Palestine Legal for short, is seeing again and again around the country. And we work nationally. Uh, so we, we are getting a, a very good sense of how widespread this problem is. There's really a concerted effort among Israel advocacy groups in the US to undermine and thwart campus activism for Palestinian rights. There are dozens, dozens of national organ and local organizations that are contributing to this effort, and I think you've heard about some of them uh, throughout the morning. Uh, and they're spending millions of dollars uh, to mount campaigns against groups, against individuals, uh, all intended to stop the momentum of the movement for Palestinian rights. And this has been now focused on campuses because of the energy of the student movement, because uh, boycott, divestments, divestment, and sanctions campaigns are gaining strength and, and students are uh, spearheading a lot of those efforts. And, and that is a, a big threat to the status quo in this country uh, and in Israel. On the most basic level, we're dealing with efforts to curb dissent on one of the few issues that has long garnered uh, unconditional bipartisan support in, in this, the nation's capital especially, as you all know, which is support for Israel. But such dissent is exactly what the First Amendment of the US Constitution is designed to protect. When government officials, including public university officials, right, uh, dictate the limits of acceptable public discourse, they're effectively censoring viewpoints that they disagree with. And universities in general have been exalted by the US Supreme Court as peculiarly the marketplace of ideas. And it has emphasized the dependence of a free society on free universities. It's also repeated that Free speech cannot be limited based on how uncomfortable it may make some people. Uh, because, quote, a function of free speech under our system of government is to invite dispute. It may indeed best serve its high purpose when it induces a condition of unrest, creates dissatisfaction with conditions as they are, 
or even stirs people to anger. Yet Israel advocacy groups have played a central role in encouraging public and private institutions to silence and punish dissent uh, uh, on the Israel-Palestine issue through a number of tactics um, uh, that often rely on complaints that students who support Israel are made uncomfortable uh, by this discourse. The dissent in question is characterized by activities such as lectures, film screenings, creative actions like mock checkpoints on campuses, mock eviction flyers being posted in dorms to give a sense of what Palestinians go through every day, and boycott and divestment campaigns, of course. These are all forms of speech that are protected from government interference by the First Amendment of the, the Constitution. Palestine Legal has, since uh, 2012, been tracking these efforts and challenging them, challenging them with legal advocacy on behalf of activists uh, that are facing backlash, like Amani, I think, uh, showed um, uh, daily. We're, we're getting an enormous amount of uh, requests for help. I'd like to elucidate some of the trends that Palestine Legal has observed in tracking the repression of Palestine activism on campuses especially. To, just to give you an idea of the volume of requests for legal advice and reports of repression that we've gotten, uh, in 2014 we documented over 240 requests and reports of incidents, which was more than double what we documented in 2013. And about 75% of these originated on campuses and involved students or academics, professors, faculty, uh, others who were who under attack. And so far this year, just in the first three months of 2015, we've already documented over 115 requests for help and incidents of repression. Again, the majority on campuses. Some of the most prominent tactics that Palestine Legal has documented include smear campaigns, legal complaints, despair treatment by universities, and interference in student democratic processes. I think we've heard a lot about uh, smear campaigns. Um, uh, Richard Falk and Alice Rothschild spoke a lot to that, uh, as has Amani, I think. Um, but smear campaigns include False accusations of anti-Semitism, as we know, against individuals and groups that criticize Israel, Israeli policies. And they rely on this false conflation of criticism of those policies with a hatred of Jewish people as a whole. Israel advocacy groups have long been promoting and attempting to codify a redefinition of anti-Semitism. If we listen to uh, Alice's definition of anti-Semitism before, uh, the news, this new def 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 definition is designed to encompass anything that delegitimizes, applies double standards to, or demonizes Israel. That can encompass anything and everything, uh, as you can imagine. And this redefinition recently appeared in student government resolutions which were passed at UC Berkeley, the University of California, Berkeley, and UCLA, uh, as well as now in a uh, California state res uh, resolution. While the definition has no legal basis, precisely because it would undermine basic First Amendment rights to engage in political speech, it nevertheless stigmatizes uh, those who are openly critical of Israeli policies and increases pressure on universities to curb such criticism. So these kinds of accusations really underlie almost all of the uh, uh, incidents that, that we document at Palestine Legal. False accusations of, uh, uh, of connections with groups to, that are designated as terrorist organizations by the US government are also very pervasive, uh, especially with students. And there's a particularly pernicious effort to associate Students for Justice in Palestine chapters, of which there are dozens in, in schools across the United States, uh, with Hamas in particular, as with the Hamas on Campus website that I think was mentioned earlier. 
Um, the, there, another effort has been uh, something that the, again, ironically named David Horowitz Freedom Center, recently posted on campuses around the country. You can see here that they had students, in justice, students for Justice in Palestine written on the top, and they depicted brutal Hamas activities against other Palestinians, and the hashtag Jew haters at the bottom. And, and we saw these on, on campuses around the country. So this same organization, the Free, Horowitz Freedom Center, also encouraged uh, students to and do mock uh, hangings on campus to uh, allegedly expose the hypocrisy of SJPs and mock stonings on campus, uh, again, in reaction to SJPs mock, um, mock checkpoints on campus, et cetera. The chilling effect on academics and students is undeniable. I mean, who wants to be branded as an anti-Semite or a terrorist just for speaking out for Palestinian rights? This has cost some, like Professor Steven Salaita, their professional careers. Uh, his tenured appointment at the University of Illinois was terminated after the Simon Wiesenthal Center and the Jewish Federation launched a campaign in reaction to what? His tweets over the summer about the Gaza war. Um, and some of them were impassioned, some of them were, uh, might have been offensive to some people. But the campaign uh, claimed he was a baseless anti-Semite and that hiring him presented a, quote, real danger to the entire campus community, especially to its Jewish students. Uh, the university responded to these complaints, including threats from major donors to pull their funding, and they refused to formalize his appointment because of his, quote, uncivil tweets uh, that they said made him unfit to teach. So this man's uh, professional career has effectively been ruined. Another common tactic that Israel advocacy groups employ at the university level is to file complaints under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. These allege that Palestine activism on campus creates a hostile environment for Jewish students, specifically those who support Israel. Complaints against universities and even the mere threat of such complaints put universities on the defensive. No such complaints have succeeded thus far legally. Um, the Department of Education's Office for Civil Rights, which investigates these complaints, has in fact dismissed roundly four such complaints. Um, and, th and they've stated very clearly that the activities complained of were protected political speech, not harassment based on national origin uh, or race and that exposure to such robust and discordant expressions, I'm quoting, even when personally offensive, is a circumstance that a reasonable student in higher education may experience. In other words, what is college for, if not to challenge students' preconceived notions of the world before they come in to college? Despite these strong decisions from the Department of Education, the chilling effect is deeply felt. And in order to avoid such complaints and accusations or to show that they're effectively responding to them, universities are erecting obstacles to pro-Palestinian student activism, investigating student activities, and disproportionately punishing uh, students and student groups because of their viewpoint that they are expressing. To give you a taste of typical bureaucratic obstacles that we're seeing, Students have reported to Palestine Legal the following. Administrators repeatedly calling in students to explain their events to administrators. Provide scripts of their uh, street theater performances. Or give names of individuals participating in, in their activities. Schools requiring student groups to pay for their own security at their events because of complaints or expected protests uh, from pro-Israel groups. Administrators telling students that they can't use the word apartheid, literally. Or that they can't use the name Students for Justice in Palestine for their student group because it's too controversial. 
excessive delays in approving events, which obviously uh, uh, impedes their ability to hold events, and changes in school policies uh, uh, in direct response to their activities so that they can't repeat them again. So this kind of bureaucratic harassment uh, has, a, has a real cumulative effect on students, draining their time and, and, and resources, and hindering their ability to put on events and generally acting to dissuade and distract them from their organizing work. Now, investigations and disciplinary actions also commonly result from Israel advocacy groups' as pressure on universities. Groups like the Zionist Organization of America, and the, again, ironically named Americans for Peace and Tolerance, pressured Northeastern University for years uh, to shut down Palestine, Palestine activism on that campus. And Northeastern has obliged. First, by putting the group Students for Justice in Palestine on probation for a brief walkout they did of an event uh, featuring an Israeli soldier talking about the ethics of the IDF. And then by suspending the SJP chapter uh, after they distributed mock eviction flyers in the dorms. To understand the university's reaction, we have to understand the nature of the pressure that Northeastern has be, been under. Americans for Peace and Tolerance first started a campaign called Shame on NEU, claiming that SJP was, quote, calling for the murder of Jews and cheerleading Hamas, among other baseless accusations. The ZOA compounded this with a threat to file a legal complaint, a Title VI complaint, as I discussed before. Um, and, and they claimed that the university tolerated a hostile environment for Jewish students by employing professor, professors that were critical of Israel and by allowing SJP to organize on campus. The ZOA made sure to copy one of its own uh, major supporters, uh, Robert Shulman, who also happened to donate $3 million to the university to build Shulman Hall, and whose statute also happens to adorn the campus. One incident at Loyola University in Chicago led to blatantly disparate disciplinary action against the SJP group there last fall. Students learned of a tabling event criticizing, uh, publicizing excuse me, birthright Israel trips, which was sponsored by the school's Hillel chapter. Uh, and they decided the night before, they learned about this the night before. Several students, mainly Palestinians, uh, spontaneously decided to line up at the table and try to register in, attempt, in an attempt to highlight the uh, program's discriminatory policies. Only Jewish students are presumed, of course, to have a birthright to the land that constitutes Israel and the Palestinian territory. And they're offered free trips there. When students lined up and calmly asked to register for a free trip, since, uh, after all, their own grandparents hailed from now destroyed villages in present-day Israel, Students manning the table immediately complained to administrators. The university under, undertook a month-long investigation, uh, and they eventually charged SJP as a group with six uh, conduct violations, included, including bias-motivated misconduct, harassment and bullying, and a violation of demonstrations, uh, school demonstration policies. SJP was ultimately found responsible for only one of the six charges, which was violating demonstration policies, not registering their uh, demonstration seven days in advance like the school requires. But the, for, this, for this infraction, uh, the, the group was placed on probation for the remainder of the year, and they couldn't access any more uh, school funds. Meanwhile, Hillel was also found responsible for not registering their tabling event. Um, their sanction, however, was vastly different. They were merely required to go and talk to administrators about what the registration policies were so that it would be clear to them in the future. So this kind of disparate treatment and just dispro disproportionate punishment has come to characterize university reactions to Palestine activism on campus. And uh, this spring, especially, we've seen a, a, a huge number of attempts to interfere in student democratic processes, especially around divestment resolutions. Um, the spring happens to be a very uh, big time for those on, on campuses. Just to give one quick example, at the University of Toledo, the Jewish Federation 
pressured the student government to close a hearing on a, 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 on a divestment resolution to all but Hillel and the SJP chapter, even though there were others, of course, supporting the initiative. And the two groups were barred from the hearing uh, room while the other one presented, so they couldn't hear the other's arguments. The Federation also held a closed door session with the student government before on anti-Semitism, to make that clear. And uh, before the resolution even came to a vote, the Judicial Council declared that it was unconstitutional and discriminatory, and it stopped the vote from taking place. Well, the, there was an uproar from students and supporters, including Palestine Legal and other attorneys uh, who, who wrote uh, to the student government. Um, and the, the student government ended up allowing an open hearing, and the resolution passed, ultimately. So what does this all mean? This doesn't even begin to explain the depth of the problem because we're seeing uh, such a huge number of cases like these that affect dozens and dozens and hundreds of individuals, uh, faculty, et cetera. We really are witnessing a situation in which it's become impossible for students and faculty on US campuses to speak out for Palestinian rights without being personally attacked and condemned as hateful and anti-Semitic and punished for their active, uh, by their universities in response to pressure from these Israel advocacy groups. The incidents that we are documenting do point to an apparent Palestine exception to the First Amendment, a situation in which public officials find it acceptable to muzzle a certain viewpoint in order to appease a strong political constituency, and often big donors, of course. In addition to the palpable effects on their direct targets, which I think Amani and Ahmed uh, point to very well, and I think Alice showed that also very well, the emotional burden uh, on people who are attacked in this way is something that is not really understood or, or talked about very much. But these repression tactics work to restrict public debate on a critical issue and thereby, thereby help preserve the status quo on Israel-Palestine in this country. Universities, think tanks, policymakers, media outlets, if any of you are here, forsake their responsibility to address one of the most prolonged human rights issues of our time when they accede to these pressure campaigns and inhibit people from speaking and protesting and taking collective nonviolent action to affect some kind of change. Without an honest and uh, critical public conversation about this, US policy in the region will continue to enable this a state of occupation and subjugation. And really, it is precisely because students and others on university campuses are reaching their peers. Uh, they're making connections, oh, it's a sound, um, between social justice movements and proposing a rights-based approach to the conflict that Israel advocacy groups are putting their thumbs on the scale now. They know it's on university campuses that the civil rights and anti-apartheid movements gain strength and that youth are the drivers of change. It's upon us to ensure, ultimately, that these voices are heard, uh, that efforts to suppress this movement are exposed and challenged, and that we allow discourse in this country to move beyond blind support for a repressive regime that we ourselves are enabling, in fact. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dima.